the best tax system on earth in the world. A column on the People's Policy Project by Ryan Cooper. I assume no relation to Roy Cooper, governor of North Carolina. What America and the world can learn from the Faroe Islands? Now, I haven't read this article, but I did look up the Faroe Islands, and this is an island nation uh, north of Denmark with about 50,000 people on it. So I am curious what lessons can be drawn from a tiny island nation's tax system. I, you know, unless you guys assumed otherwise, I don't actually know a lot about the Faroe Islands. Uh, frankly, I probably wouldn't have known the Faroe Islands really existed without reading this article. Uh, what with it being such a tiny country. So we'll see about what their tax system is. I'm curious to see if it is truly the best tax system in the world and what Ryan Cooper of the People's Policy Project has to say about it. I can tell you from this picture, it looks like quite a neat little island. It's kind of a cute little town here. Look, they've got the, the green architecture and everything. Looks great. So let's learn and let's see what makes it apparently the best tax system on earth. I don't know if this is an ironic article, but it's not April Fool's Day. So uh, we'll see what the argument is. It's the worst turbulence I've ever felt. For moments, it feels as though the winds have fallen off the plane. Out of the window, I can see the wind tearing shreds of water off the heavy surf. I clench up my seatbelt and hold on to the seat for dear life. But the rest of the passengers seem unbothered. Across the aisle, even a one-year-old baby is completely serene, sitting in its mother's lap. My plane is landing at the Vagar Airport in the Faroe Islands, and apparently extreme weather is something even babies get used to here. The lesson is emphasized when I get off the plane. No jet bridge in an airport this small and almost get blown away uh, by the wind. The Faroes, a group of 18 islands in the North Atlantic, about halfway between Norway and Iceland, are a peculiar, a peculiar place. They're part of the Kingdom of Denmark, but also semi-independent. All Faroese are Danish citizens and use the Danish kroner as currency, but they have control over most other aspects of domestic and foreign policy. They are not part of the European Union, mostly run their own welfare state, and have negotiated separate fishing and trade treaties with neighboring countries. But I'm not particularly, I'm not primarily here to report on the blustery fall squalls or the staggeringly beautiful scenery or the abundance of sheep or the cuisine that fermented fish is actually worth trying, or even the local legend about seals that can turn into women. The reason why this tiny village of Mikladur has a huge bronze statue of a naked woman on its beach? No, I'm here to investigate the tax authority, which is called tax. The pharaohs have a tax system that is unique even among its Nordic neighbors, and probably the best in the world. Its operating principles are centralization, efficiency, and simplicity. It's not the most riveting subject for a travel holiday, I'll readily admit, but it is beautiful in its own way, and it makes a major difference in the lives of every Faroese person, from the lowest worker to the owner of the biggest businesses. It's hard to imagine fully implementing such a system in the United States, but we might still, but we still might learn from their example. Oh, they've got the, the dude bro cows with the fancy hairdos. Interesting. It's one of those countries with the, 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 the long sort of dude bro, almost like skateboarder hair. The Faroese are one of the richest countries in the world by per capita GDP, even slightly richer than Denmark itself. On first sight, this is rather hard to believe. The islands are 180 miles from the Shetland Islands on one side and 400 miles from Iceland on the other, with a population of just 54,000. It rarely gets that cold thanks to the warm Gulf Stream current, but it also doesn't get that warm even in the brief summer. Thanks to the northerly location, in the winter, there are only about five hours of sunlight per day. The land is impossibly gorgeous, with fjords, brilliant green hills, and spectacular cliffs everywhere you look. One particularly remote promotory was used as a setting for the villain's lair in the most recent James Bond villain, a James Bond movie. In ce celebration, the government set up a gravestone carved by a local stonemason at the site where in the film, spoiler alert, Bond supposedly dies. But it's a harsh beauty. When I hiked up to visit the grave marker near the famous Collar Lighthouse, the views left me spellbound, but relentless winds felt like it could easily carry me off one of the hundred foot cliffs on every side. On another trek out to the um, Balasavar waterfall, I learned that a Chinese woman out hiking with her husband had disappeared on the same trail, almost certainly because she fell into the ocean. After days of searching, authorities gave, up, uh, gave her up for dead.
So how is this isolated, rugged place so rich? It turns out that the Faroese have turned fish into a cutting-edge economic engine. First, some of the world's most sophisticated fishing operations make big money ca catching uh, pelagic fish like mackerel, blue whiting, and herring. A smaller sector catches uh, dimmer, uh, dimmer sol, that is bottom feeding fish like cod and haddock. Quote, the only thing we export of goods is fish and some form. Hans Elsman, an economist at the University of the Faroe Islands, told me. The total catch is about 30 to 40,000 tons of dimmer, uh, dimmer sol fish and 500,000 tons of pelagics. Out in the harbor town at Torshvan, the capital, I have saw some of these huge fish vessels sparkling clean, uh, fatuned with electric equipment, not the grimy trawlers I have been vaguely expecting. Second, an even more sophisticated aquaculture industry has grown in the Faroe Fjords, largely farming salmon from eggs to fry to fully grown fish, in a way that avoids disease, parasites, and excessive pollution. That's created a secondary export industry of subcontractors. Aquaculture is a is quite a complicated operation, so we have a lot of companies who produce lighting systems for the fish cages, feed barges, uh, monitoring systems. Niels Winther, managing director of an employer association called the House of Industry, told me. As a result, salmon alone, which commands a substantial price premium thanks to its color and taste, account for 45% of Faroese exports. Taken together, fish represent about a fifth of the Faroese economy, and fishing by far its highest paying jobs. The fishing business and the fact that the Faroese have been living off the sea for over a thousand years seems to give locals an unsentimental attitude towards ocean ecosystems. At one point, in a bar three dunk, tall young men like the rest of Western Europe, the average Faroese height seems to be several inches above the American figure, loomed over me and politely but sternly demanded to know whether I ate chicken or beef. When I responded in the affirmative, they argued that this meant Americans should drop their opposition to whaling. I later learned that this is because there's a tradition, a traditional annual hunt of pilot which whales called uh, Grinderap, towards which American environmentalists have been highly critical. Alas, my suggestion to create trade and end to abusive feedlots and whaling at the same time was not received enthusiastically. Man, I really wish that this person would get to the point. <laughs> My God, man, I get it. The Faroese Islands, it's beautiful, it's great. I talk to the locals. I just want to learn about the tax system. I guess some people need this in their articles, right, to, to make it not as boring and engaging, but my God, you know? Now, the part about talking about how the, the fishing sort of ocean economy of the Faroese is important, I mean, that makes sense, but all these anecdotes and the story about the Chinese woman and, you know, this, you know, how beautiful it is, it's like, gosh, you know, I mean, I don't want to say I don't care, but I mean... The title of the article is talking about the tax system, you know? Come on, let's get to it. All right, here we go. That said, the Faroese government has implemented both internal quotas and trade agreements to prevent overfishing, thanks in part to a drastic collapse of catches in the mid-1990s that helped trigger an economic crisis, causing the population to shrink by about 10% in just a few years. Everyone agrees that must be avoided at any cost. Even the fishing companies agree that the country should not kill the golden herring, though there is a lot of dispute about the shade of marine regulations, both internally and with other countries. The shape of marine regulations. The crisis also partly motivated the establishment of a national bank, the Landsbanki for Jura, which handles the issuance of government debt, monitors financial risks, and maintains a rainy day investment portfolio equal to 15% of GDP. That is a, that is a huge percentage. <laughs> If there comes a crisis, we have some liquidity to spend and prepare for what to do. Uh, Marlon Johnson, uh, or Johansson, the bank's managing director, told me, Not for the first time, I was struck by the contrast of the Faroese cautious economic diligence compared to the slapdash American governance. If the U.S. established such an account, it would have about $3.5 trillion in it. The overall Faroese economy is frankly bursting with prosperity. Unemployment has been below 4% since 2015, below 2% 2 since 2019, and currently sits at a mind-bogglingly 0.5%, an all-time record low. Employers are so desperate for workers that immigrant laborers from all over the world are common. I met a friendly Polish bartender named uh, Mateusz who had actually been recruited from Iceland. The Faroese in income inequality is the lowest in the world. Its Gini index, where zero would be perfect equality and one all income going to one person, is 0.21, below even the other Nordics and far, far below the American figure of 0.49. Underpinning the Faroese economy is an exceptionally sleek and efficient tax system. One way to start to appreciate the magnificence of tax is by thinking about how Americans pay taxes. 
Imagine you run a medium-sized business with a few dozen employees. You're legally required to spend your workers' payroll and income taxes to the government, so you hire a payroll processor like ADP or QuickBooks to handle that for you, along with employer-sponsored insurance and other benefits. It costs something like $50 a month per employee, and you have to go through an annoying onboarding process every time you hire someone. Or imagine you're one of those employees. At the very least, you've got to file a bunch of obnoxious paperwork to the IRS everywhere. You make money. You, you, if you make much money at all, it's advisable to keep track along the way of everything that might be eligible for some tax deduction, your mortgage interest, child expenses, commuting costs, and so on, and enter it all correctly come tax day. It gets worse if you have a side job. Your two bosses don't talk to each other, so they don't withhold the correct amounts of your tax from your combined income. You've got to figure out what you owe and instruct uh, one or the other job to withhold more money or send quarterly payments to the IRS or sort it out when you file your tax return and potentially pay a penalty for underpaying. This all adds to an enormous burden on the American people and our economy. Filing taxes takes up an estimated 6.5 billion hours each year. As the right-leaning tax foundation points out, the equivalent of 3.1 million people working full-time for the whole year. Assuming average wages for the type of work involved, that adds to a 313 billion burden a dollar burden on the economy. In terms of actual business, the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that there are 83,190 tax prepayers or preppers making an average income of $51,080. Payroll processing is also a big business and a necessary employer expense. I sat down at the tax office with Director Eowyn my god the names uh, i'm just gonna say director em and its head of communications dg who explained how fairways businesses and workers face about as little of this kind of hassle and expenses as could be imagined here are all ordinary wage and tax transactions here, all ordinary wage and tax transactions are processed through a central government system, and a tax automatically takes out whatever it estimates you owe before the money is deposited in your bank account, along with any welfare payments like family or unemployment benefits, pension payments, and so on. Self-employed people and businesses do have to file tax returns, but this cannot be avoided. So if I understand the system at this point, basically what it sounds like is all payments to people and to businesses first go into an account and then the payments are deducted basically by this tax system before being fully deposited so you know i guess there's like an extra step to actual deposits in your bank uh, but i suppose uh, that's the efficiency that you get because it's all centralized and you don't have to worry about what you owe at the end of the year the pharaohs also have an exceptionally clean tax code. With no deductions of any kind for ordinary employment income, a simple tax code, of course, is easier to administer, and M does his best to keep it that way. If the politicians are trying to make some changes, I try to defend my tax system. Don't do it that way, do it another way, he said. The point isn't to tell the government what kinds of policies it should do, but to urge them to be done in the most efficient manner. He pointed to a commuter benefit run by tax that is administered as a direct payment instead of a tax deduction like it is in Denmark. This is extreme simplicity. This extreme simplicity is unique even among the Nordics. Norway, Finland, and Sweden all have deductions, though of course not nearly as many as the U.S. With our rat's nest of tax loopholes, as of 2022, the Treasury Department counts up 165 tax expenditures, a big reason why the American tax code takes up something like 2,600 pages. The Faroese code could be printed on a fancy restaurant menu. Remarkably, nobody I spoke to with was uh, nobody I spoke with was quite sure about how and why the tax system developed. Uh, M said it was developed in 1984 with, wow, literally 1984, with help from the Danish government, but wasn't sure why. DH, an advisor at the Ministry of Finance, speculated that one possible reason Denmark didn't adopt it was because at the time it was already had a world-class tax system, while the Faroese did not. My sense is that tax was only a modest improvement back in the 80s, but with the rise of computing technology and the internet, its clean foundation allowed it to improve greatly. Other European and Asian countries have tax authorities that calculate your tax liability for you each year and thus require little more than an annual check-in uh, in for normal employees. That's far better than how the IRS works in the U.S., outsourcing much of the bureaucracy to ordinary citizens. But tax is a substantial upgrade, even from the world's most efficient and hassle-free tax system, which provides several immediate advantages. First, because it monitors every income stream for each individual and does, uh, does it continuously instead of once a year, it can automatically adjust tax withholding on the fly and almost always hits the correct figure. When the year is over, almost everybody ends up with, oh, it's correct, I don't have to pay anymore and I don't get any money back, said M. Continuous collections also eliminates the time risk of government losing out on tax payments if companies go bankrupt before tax could cash their checks. 
Second, nearly all government benefits are consolidated and partly automated. Instead of welfare agencies having to maintain uh, their own payment systems, like how each American state maintains a separate unemployment bureaucracy, many of which are severely dysfunctional, the government simply tells tax who is eligible for what program, and the payments are rolled into their daily distribution. Third, most of the burden of payroll processing is removed from employers. Businesses there are very happy about this, M told me. They don't have to do anything else. They don't have to transfer some money to the tax authorities or some pensions or the other funds, nothing. It's all done at the same time. Fourth, tax requirements that everything tax requirement that everything happens through their bank-centered system both greatly simplifies their administrative tasks and ensures that virtually every person has a bank account. It is impossible to get any money from the government if you do not have a bank account. Nothing is paid out through a check. It doesn't exist, said M. Partly because that requirement, uh, plain vanilla bank accounts, take only a few minutes to obtain for any native fairies, or just a bit longer for an immigrant so long as they have a job. In America, by contrast, there are an estimated 6 million unbanked people who rely on payday lenders or other financial predators for simple access to payment systems. And about 70% of adults don't have internet access, and so couldn't use any tax-style automated customer service tools. Tools. Fifth, statistics. Uh, Fair. Fifth, statistics. Faroe Islands, the national statistics agency called um, Hakstova Faroya in Faroese, has access to data of unparalleled quali quality and timelessness. The tax system is a big source of Faroese statistics. HV, an agency statistician, told me. We collect all taxes and income in microdata, which they use to publish regular analyses of economic trends. By way of comparison, U.S. agencies typically rely on surveys for these purposes. The, Centro, the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, for instance, maintains the current population survey, CPS, which contacts about 60,000 households monthly to interview them about their jobs, income, and other questions. The results are then demographically adjusted such that they represent the whole American population to create macroeconomic figures. BLS statisticians are smart as they come, but this process is both cumbersome and potentially wrong. Initial estimates are adjusted after their initial publication and are frequently found to be inaccurate. SFI, by contrast, publishes unemployment and income figures that are close to a literal representation of the Faroese economy as could be imagined, with every single job and what it actually pays down to the krona included. And because the vast majority of the data is collected automatically, this comprehensive data is actually easier to collect than surveys. Um, at, uh, at the time of writing, the most recent unemployment report found there were exactly 151 full-time unemployed in Faroe, uh, 151 unemployed Faroese. Other Nordics uh, also use tax administrative data for their national statistics, but they aren't as timely as the Faroese. The IRS does not have administrative data based on tax returns, but very few institutions are allowed to access them, and they are far less accurate thanks to rampant tax avoidance and errors. On its face, an ultra-efficient tax authority doesn't seem to like an especially Nordic-style project in the usual traditional tradition of strong labor unions, generous welfare states, and so on, though it does have those things as well. It might even be considered somewhat conservative. The right-leaning tax foundation, for instance, is constantly complaining about the onerous burden created by America's ultra-complicated tax code. Before the quit politics, before he quit politics, Paul Ryan used to talk about how great it would be to file your taxes on a postcard, though he did nothing of the sort with his signature policy accomplishment of the 2017 tax law. Republicans, of course, deliberately starved the IRS over the last decade. The agency has a taxpayer advocate service, which produced uh, a annual report to Congress on how the agency is functioning, and the 2021 version reads like someone who has been locked in a basement, surviving on chicken bones and crust of bread for 15 years, shouting out a window, begging passerbys for help. There is no way to sugarcoat the year 2021 in tax administration. From the perspective of tens of millions of taxpayers, it was horrendous, the report admits. Oh, that's pretty dire. <laughs> Cataloging tens of millions of delays in returns and refund processing. This was due in part to a big backlog of unprocessed returns from the previous two years. The worst phone service in IRS history, a glacially slow response to IRS requests for corrections, and on and on. Money is the main problem. The number of individual income tax returns in the IRS the IRS receives has increased by 19% in the since fiscal year 2010, while its baseline appropriation on an inflation-adjusted basis has decreased by nearly 20%. This is because Republicans took control of the House in 2010 and refused to fund the IRS so that it would stop auditing rich people and corporations, which did indeed happen. Because the agency is barely keeping on top of immediate tasks, it has no leftover money to upgrade its increasingly agent systems. The two IRS systems containing the official records of individual and business taxpayer accounts are the oldest major technology systems in the federal government, notes the report, which only leads to more spending over the long term. 
Other problems lie outside the agency, however. The IRS still spends billions laboriously processing paper returns by hand and sending out paper checks, but it couldn't impose an online-only requirement without help from Congress to get universal access to bank accounts and the internet. The latest reconciliation bill passed by the Democrats had an additional $80 billion for the IRS over the next decade, which is obviously highly welcome. But it will take years for the agency just to digest itself, just to dig itself out from its current holes, much less to begin modernizing its procedures, and who knows what Republicans might do the next time they take power. Faroese conservatism, such that it is, bears absolutely no resemblance to that of U.S. Republicans. But when MNG started talking about the tax budget, it sounded a little familiar. I have a slide here. I love to show it. M said, "There is one. In, uh, this one is how much we cost to finance our work here. In 2012, we cost 72.8 million. This year, we cost 70.5 million, less than we did 10 years ago, and the economy has grown a lot since." As I listened to M, however, it became clear the implications of his austere budget were not remotely what they would be in America. In fact, they were the exact opposite. I realized that the greatest benefit of all uh, uh, of all of how the pharaohs uh, had the pharaohs had set up their tax system had to do with the tax agency itself. The need for workers at tax has been gradually cut back by careful automation of routine processes, while the remaining staffers have focused even more on auditing rich people and companies. Indeed, that's one reason for the efficiency upgrades, so it can plow some of the savings into audit audits. Big companies are consuming quite a lot of energy in-house. We don't want to skip that, said G. Um, e, he really wants to make uh, that more intensive, but that's why we want IT to be better. He wants to take the resources and put it into the controlling department. Instead of the tax budget being randomly hacked away by an extremist party with an ideological hatred of taxation, staff had been cut back only when doing so uh, would not reduce the accuracy of tax collection. On the contrary, collections from audits have increased over time. In 2015, it collected about 60 million kroner, while in 2021, we did corrections for 250 million kroner, and that's mostly businesses, said M proudly. Meanwhile, the broader economic content, context changes the implications of streamlining the tax system. The rest of the Faroese economy is so red-hot and desperate for workers that cutting back on tax staffing and budgeting material helps everyone else by freezing up resources and workers. I have told all the people here that in 10 years we are going to be less than 100 because we have to be more efficient, M said. And I think it's the right thing to do, the right way to do, because the tax authority we have to be as efficient as possible, so cheap as possible, so we can have more money or more staff at the hospital taking care of the elderly, things like that. Visiting the Faroese, I learned a whole new way that America is humiliating is a humiliating international laggard. Our tax system is about the worst of all possible worlds, expensive, ultra complicated, inefficient, slow, inaccurate, and an enormous headache for its citizenry. And there's another option that reverses virtually all of those factors. After returning to the States and thinking it over for a time, I've concluded that tax would not have been built without the broader context of Nordic social democracy. Ideologically, the absence of deductions and butter-smooth tax payment uh, processes reflects a profound acceptance of government, especially stiff taxation, that is radically at odds with America's ways of thinking. We are, added, we are addicted to tax deductions, credits, and exemptions because this style of policy allows their recipients to pretend as if they are rugged individualists who don't depend on government help and as if taxes are a are a, uh, a species of theft. A species of theft. I've never heard that phrasing before. The habit is so deeply ingrained that even when Democrats were passing major climate policy in the Inflation Reduction Act, nearly the entire energy investment program was camouflaged as a tax benefit, in the process adding even more paperwork headaches for the beleaguered IRS. So that is a, that's a little bit misleading. So I think that the the IRA is an interesting one because it's true that what the expansion of the IRA was was the expansion of tax credits. Now, part of that, people will say, is a regulatory requirement because America uh, is a federalized system, right? So it's 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 hard for the federal government to just uh, you know Im impose certain mandates uh, when it comes to renewables investment in industries and things like that. Um, but another part of it, which is interesting, and I'm not sure if it's more effective than like an actual direct subsidy is by requiring a tax equity investor. For those that don't know, the way that basically it works with the IRA tax benefits is when you uh, qualify for like an investment tax credit for a solar project, you know, you built a $100 million solar project. So simply, you know, simply, simply speaking, uh, you have a 30% investment tax credit. So your tax credit is up to $30 million. Now that's putting it incredibly simply. So any renewable energy nerds don't get on me on that. But the point is, is that 
Um, the $30 million doesn't actually go to the person that built the solar plant. Um, who it goes to is a tax equity investor. Basically, an outside partner comes in, invests that money into the project, and then receives the tax benefits um, in accordance with whatever uh, regulations. Now, you might ask yourself, why the fuck would it be even, why would that even possibly be the best way to run it? Um, well, the idea, uh, I think, simply put, was that we it, it's not a broad-based subsidy, right? It's not that anyone who builds any solar plant gets it. Um, the government wants to give money or, or tax breaks to people who build good projects. Uh, and so with the idea of, you know, good sort of economically beneficial projects, do you want the IRS or whoever would be giving out the, the tax credit or the benefits to be... Uh, doing all of that due diligence? Uh, the answer is probably no, it's probably inefficient, and probably uh, they're not as good at it. So uh, we're going to basically allow uh, banks and like private investors to do due diligence on whether projects are good and then decide whether or not they want to invest on the tax equity side. And then they're the ones that capture the benefits. And then the project level people capture the investment from tax equity people. So the investors get tax breaks and then the renewable energy people get a bunch more extra capital uh, that they didn't have to them previously. But Anyway, that's a long and probably unnecessary rant. I just thought it was interesting to point that out that the, the IRA and like renewable energy tax credits could be an instance where um, it actually might be more efficient to add in that third partner. But I'd have to look at other models. I'm only familiar with how the U.S. subsidizes renewables. I'm not sure how many other countries do it. I know that the tax credit system is like kind of a unique U.S. thing. So. All right. Next up. That is not to say that the Faroese don't have a conservative side. On the contrary, the conservative coalition won the last election in 2019 and upon taking power, scrapped an auction system for fishing permits the prior leftist government had set up. But the contest between right and left takes place between political goalposts that might as well be on a different planet from the U.S., so it's probably out of question to think that we could simply copy and paste the tax system into America, but we could still learn from their example. We, not be a, we might not be able to scrap every deduction in the tax code or have every payment routed through a central system, but we could, opt, we could build an opt-in system for anyone who dislikes paperwork, and we could have a cheaper IRS with fewer staff that handled most tax returns automatically if we cared to follow the Fairway's example of careful long-term investment in computers and automation. I'm sure Director M would be happy to explain to any IRS official how he's done it. Just remember to bring a rain jacket. I think this was an interesting article. I think that it was actually a fairly balanced perspective on the advantages of this Faroe Island system, although I do think that this person <laughs> took a little bit of a while to get to the point. I think that Fundamentally, uh, what we can learn from this system is having some sort of government option for banking is probably a good thing. Allowing it to be opt-in is probably a good thing. Um, the advantages could be cheaper fees and also um, easier ways to get your benefits. So it could disproportionately help lower income people. Um, so that's where things like, you know, Federal Reserve Banking or Postal Banking make a ton of sense. Um, and uh, also investing a ton into the automation of the IRS systems and computerization of IRS system probably also makes a lot of sense. Part of what Joe Biden did, which this article doesn't speak to, is invest a ton of money with his infrastructure deal into rural broadband access. The reality is most people in urban areas have access to pretty damn good internet. It's kind of a rural problem that people don't have internet. And so that solves part of the problem of putting these types of systems online. But having an online application system, uh, which I believe free file and online applications are things that the current Treasury Department under Janet Yellen uh, is looking at, um, they're making moves in the right direction. And also that $8 billion investment per year, something that this article also mentioned, is a great first step as well. So it sounds like, at least in part, whether, uh, you know, Biden knew about the Faroese Island model or not, um, is, is actually inadvertently or directly learning uh, from this that, you know, more computerization, more internet filing, free filing, um, you know, options for banking. I think even there were there were pilot studies on postal banking, uh, which had interesting results, I suppose, um, you know, things like that. Uh, I think are steps in the right direction, and I think people will like it, um, and we'll see how, f basically, how widespread that implementation is. I only hope that Biden can at least get it somewhat implemented before he uh, leaves office, potentially in 2025 uh, or uh, potentially in 2029, uh, if he decides to run and 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 does actually win re-election. So I'm interested in all that stuff. This was a pretty good article, I think, um, although <laughs> somewhat somewhat overly long i would say i thought it was a good article and i hope we learned a little something about how terrible a lot of the u.s tax system is <laughs> <laughs>